Facebook Live. From Medina. At the hardware store. Yes. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to you. To you, my love. How are you? Pretty good. I feel good. like we're in a tiny car right now. Yes, yeah, a tiny car. Boy, <laughs> squeeze in here. Squeeze in. Well, you got a nice car, though. <laughs> How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. It's nice to see you. Good to see you. Yes. Yeah. Blessings upon you this holy Sabbath day. Yes. How you doing? Good. 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 Very good. That makes me happy. Yeah. Anyways, we got a Bible study. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The nonviolent image of God. Yes. Yeah. And so, let's see. We got Cindy here. Hello, Cindy. Happy Sabbath. We know my mom's coming. Hello, mom. Happy Sabbath. We know Ed, Felicia, Emily's coming. We know Don Layton, David Sherwood, Dolores, Victoria. Keeley, the Hecox is coming. We know Harvey's coming. Grace Lynn, Bentley, Wrigley, um, Jonathan, Gatlin is coming. So we thank everybody for coming. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Good to see you, Mom. And I hope everybody is having a blessed day. Let's pray. Are you ready to pray? I'm ready to pray. If we didn't say hi to you, Curtis, Denise, Ozzy, we love y'all. Thank y'all for coming. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings of the Holy Sabbath. As we celebrate the beauty and excellency of your agape love, we just look to you with expectant eyes for a blessing of the outpouring of the Spirit. So, Heavenly Father, teach us about your nonviolent image. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, thank you, my love. May I have a Bible? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. Not, not that way. There we go. Sorry. We got tricks. We got all kinds of stuff. Sure. That's all right, love. Good. Yep. She getting that Bible for me, everybody. There well, you go. well, thank you very much. You okay, so a nonviolent revelation of God, which we talk about this really all the time now, but it's an important topic, and really, it's about how one idea can change everything that we know about God, salvation, sin scripture humanity so let's get into it first john chapter 4 verse 8 he that loves not knows not god for god is love that love is agape and so for us to know and understand god we got to know and understand agape because that's who god is psalm 18 verse 30 says god is perfect and malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says that god is unchangeable this is who god has always been love perfect unchangeable we have three core Bible study principles that we always use. We set the tone for each Bible study with these core beliefs because we believe that they're very important. Bible study principle number one, God is agape. That agape juice down is perfect self-control, perfectly considering others more important than God considers himself, and not being personally offended by sin. That can be a revelation for some people because we've been taught and indoctrinated that God is offended by sin. But as we look at the perfect revelation of God in Jesus, we see he was never offended by sin, but he spent time purposely touching, healing, feeding, and caring for sinners. We can find God as agape and what that looks like in a greater sense in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. Our second core Bible study principle is that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of the Father. John 14, 9, if you see me, you see the Father. This redefines who God is for us in the life of Jesus. Our third core Bible study principle is that biblical principle explains the scriptures and scripture explains biblical principle. Isaiah 28, verse 10 says, for precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Every Bible study, every doctrine, every truth is simply a puzzle. And I know there's some masterful puzzle makers out there. Linda and Mark Bennett, we never say hello to you. We know that you watch, we miss you, and we apologize for not saying hello. We know you're master puzzle makers. Thank you for always sharing our Bible studies. But every doctrine, every, everything about the Bible is a puzzle. And when they rightly go together by the leading of the Spirit, you see these beautiful truths about the character of God, the, the, the history of humanity, and how God rightly 
tells us all these different things in the Bible that are deep revelations about existence. Today we're going to talk about the nonviolent image of God. And how we view God is very important because it directly affects our character. Micah chapter 4, verse 5. Micah chapter 4, verse 5 says this. For all people will walk, everyone in the name of his God. And we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Now, this verse is actually talking about the character. 1 Samuel 25, 25 says, As his name is, so is he. So in Micah 4, 5, when it says, Everyone walks in the name of his God, that's a symbol for everyone walks in the character of his God. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Second Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory or the character of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So this idea that we're talking about of beholding and being transformed into what we behold, this is the design law of worship. In the beginning, we were created in such a way that the things that we focus on, the things we pay attention to, are the things that we become like. So if we focus on the truth about God, specifically in the face of Jesus, we are transformed into that same image according to the design law of worship. Now, the exact opposite is true. If we focus on wrong things, if we focus on wrong ideas, these wrong ideas ultimately transform us into an image of a false God. So if we have wrong imaginations about God and we focus on those, those wrong ideas will transform in us a wrong character. Psalm 115 verse 4. Psalm 115, verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. They have noses, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them so is everyone that trusts in them. So the design law of worship, as you behold something, you become like it. That was designed for a good thing, to behold the image of God as it really is in the life of Christ. We will be transformed into that image. But if we have idols or if we have misconceptions about God, we'll be transformed into that same image. So our view of God is very important because it directly affects our minds and the mind is where the character is stored because our thoughts specifically about God those turn into our words about God and those words about God turn into our actions of God and our actions turn into our habits with God and our habits turn into our character and all of this is based on how we view God. If we behold a God of love, who in, in whom is no violence, then ultimately we will reflect a God of love in whom there is no violence in our character. But if we behold an angry God who uses violence, that is what the character we will ultimately develop over a course of time. In the beginning, God created our brains like supercomputers. And every computer receives information. And what information a computer receives is the information that the computer displays. This is exactly how our minds are. The information that our minds receive is the information that our minds display. So our understanding of God is a lot like how a computer works specifically a computer spreadsheet. 
in a spreadsheet you have all these different blocks called information cells and each cell is connected and dependent on the information in the other cells when you change the information in one cell on a computer spreadsheet it affects all the information that are found in the other cells so in a computer spreadsheet you have all these cells and you're entering numbers and decimal points if a single number is wrong or a single decimal point is out of place it will affect all the other cells and there'll be a ripple effect throughout the entire spreadsheet and ultimately what happens when that takes place is that when you get to the end of the spreadsheet all the information is wrong this exact same thing happens to our minds when we have wrong ideas about God when we have wrong ideas about the Bible it affects every other aspect of all the information gathered so let's look at a passage and let's see how one comma moved from one point to another can give us two different ideas Luke 23 20 Luke 23 43 Luke 23:43 This is the thief on the cross and he said unto Jesus remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom verse 43 listen to what Jesus says and Jesus said unto him verily I say unto thee <coughs> comma today thou shalt be with me in paradise it's very important. Now you take that comma and put it on the other side. You're going to come up with a completely different conclusion. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, comma, thou shalt be with me in paradise. So the placement of a comma is very important because in one section, if you put the comma after truth, it will be, I tell you the truth today you'll be with me in paradise that means that Jesus and the thief were going to be in paradise that day of the crucifixion which we know is not possible but if you put the comma after today and it says I tell you the truth today you will be with me in paradise it's a completely different understanding one says today you will be with me in paradise today and another is a statement that is made today you will be with me in paradise they're very important one view ultimately leads to the idea that when you die you go to heaven immediately and another view leads to the conclusion that one day you will be in paradise after the resurrection so one comma out of place can create ideas and thoughts and doctrines that should not exist so if someone starts out with wrong ideas someone starts out with wrong information about God the more you learn about the Bible the more you learn about God that original point of wrong information will affect the rest of your understanding about God and the Bible for example just quickly we're going to talk about death real quick and how this idea of death can radically change how we view God, scripture salvation sin and humanity most Christianity teaches that when you die you go to heaven or hell this one idea affects how we view God scripture salvation sin and all humanity around us but let's see what Jesus has to say let's see what scripture has to say about what happens when we die quickly just to just to show a point John chapter 11 verse 11 now this may be new for some people this probably is not new for a lot of people who study with us all the time but this idea of what happens when we die radically changes everything John 11 11 these things said he after that he saith unto them our friend Lazarus sleeps but I go that I may awake him out of sleep then his disciples said Lord if he sleeps he shall do well 
howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus says that death is asleep. Jesus never says that we, when we die, we go to heaven. So that's one point. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since before there was a nation, even to that same time. And at the time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So Daniel, the prophet, said that death was sleep and that we wait for a resurrection. Psalm 13.3. A lot of us know this. Some of us don't. But it's a point. How radical our thoughts and ideas can change in a moment, which change everything. Psalm 13.3. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So over and over the scripture says that the first death is a state of unconscious sleep. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13. Here we go. First Thessalonians 4, 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, concerning them which are dead, that ye should sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, which are dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So Paul taught that the first death was sleep. Let's look at this verse and see what happens during death. What takes place? Ecclesiastes 9.5 Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5 For the living know that they shall die but the dead know not anything neither have they any more reward for their memory for the memory of them is forgotten also their love their hatred their envy is now perished neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun so it's very important that the dead are in an unconscious state of existence. Last verse, Psalm 6, 4. Psalm 6, 4. Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembering of you. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? So it's pretty clear about the state of the dead, that when we die, we wait for a resurrection. In that state of death, we're sleeping. There's n no remembrance of anything. There's no remembrance of God. There's no praising God. So this idea of what takes place during death is radically different. And it affects how we view the entire Bible. It affects how we view God, salvation, sin, and humanity. So we sleep in the grave. This Bible study is not about death. It's just an example on how one new biblical perspective can change a person's view, which has secondary changes that ultimately affect everything we believe. Many of us who have been in present truth know about the state of the dead and the first resurrection. Not everybody does. And this idea of going to heaven or hell when we die changes everything which will have secondary changes, which changes a whole bunch of 
things. So, one change in how we view what happens when we die changes how we view God. It changes how we view Scripture. It changes how we view salvation. It changes how we view humanity. If this is what happens when we change our view on what happens when we die, we should expect even greater changes when we alter our view from a violent, angry God to a loving, nonviolent God. When we do this, we should expect massive shifts in how we view God, Scripture, forgiveness, salvation, humanity, and how we live as God's people in this earth. This is vastly important. This is why sometimes I'll say things that sound so radically different than what we've been taught as Christians is because my view of God from an angry, angry violent God to a, a, a loving, non-violent God has changed how I view God, how I view Scripture, how I view salvation, how I view sin, how I view humanity. And personally, my own views have had drastic shifts over the years. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've studied with us for the past four years or even greater, I can talk about my mom and specifically Brother Ed. You have seen the shift in my thinking. The massive shifts of how I understand scriptures, God, salvation, sin, humanity, is so drastic that if I would have said to myself some of the things that I now believe, if I would have said these things to myself four years ago, I would have called myself a heretic. That's how much my mind has shifted because of the nonviolent view of God. And the Bible studies that we do, they're not intended to like rewrite doctrine. That's not what they're about. The Bible studies that we do, they're not intended to guilt people into leaving their denominational churches. That's between you and God. I have no interest in telling you what to do in your walk with God. The Bible studies that we do, they're not intended to be rude, nor are they intended to be rough. We speak things plainly and straightforward, but the Bible studies that we do are like one family's journey to know and understand God. That journey has led us from believing in a violent, angry God to now believing in a loving, nonviolent God. And we believe that this loving, nonviolent God is revealed in the life of Jesus, specifically Jesus on the cross. And each Bible study we do, is really just a topic of something that we have learned or relearned about God, right? Specifically through the nonviolent revelation of Jesus. And as we learn and relearn scripture, humanity, sin, salvation, God, through this nonviolent revelation of God, we present these Bible studies for the sake of simply introducing others to some of the changes that have occurred in our own mind because of the ideas that we've come across. Some of these ideas are the nonviolent revelation of God's agape love, which we talk about all the time. Another idea that we've learned is the design law that God used to create existence. And to juice that down, design law is simply the principles that make life possible. And sin is violating the principles that make life possible. Another idea that came we came across was the two trees in the Garden of Eden. These are the opposing principles of righteousness and iniquity. It's the principles that make life possible and the principles that make death possible. We do Bible studies on topics to show what we believe, why we believe it, and how our views have changed over the course of time since we started believing in a nonviolent God. I know certain people who have studied with us for a long time have seen and talked about these drastic changes in our own lives. These changes do not necessarily occur in everybody who adopts a nonviolent view, nor do we believe that these changes have to be made. 
we do believe that these changes take place once our ideas of God change. And once we start changing how we perceive God, that's a ripple effect that ultimately changes how we view Scripture, how we view sin, salvation, and humanity. If these things happen in your life, they could, but they may not if you accept the nonviolent revelation of God. So one of the things that changed for us was that we started to view God as a heavenly father. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 says this. After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So when Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, how to interact with the Father, he immediately draws our attention to how God views himself as a heavenly father. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. He could have drawn our minds to anything. Creator, king, the one above all. And those are all true statements. That's what God is. But Jesus draws our minds to the ultimate reality of how God views himself. God views his relationship to us as a loving Heavenly Father. That was a radical shift in how I viewed God because from that moment on, we began to see God and humanity as a family relationship. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Right? This agape love is another radical shift in how we perceive God because if we want to understand what God is like we have to understand that he is agape 1 Corinthians 13 4 to 7 1 Corinthians 13 4 to 7 agape suffers long that God suffers long and is kind. Agape envies not. Agape does not exalt itself. Agape is not puffed up. It does not behave itself unseemly, inappropriately. Agape seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Agape bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. This is a very good explanation of the character, the method, and the principles of God. And it's described as agape. And what it's saying to us is that God is absolute patience. He has complete self-control. It says that God considers us of supreme value. It says that God isn't disgusted with us. God isn't embarrassed of us because we're sinners. God doesn't exalt himself over us with an inflated ego seeking to suppress me, control me. That's not how agape is. God isn't offended by my sin. God has no evil thoughts towards me. God considers all of us more important than he considers himself. He never gives up on us. God always hopes in us. God always believes in us. God always trusts us because he is our loving Heavenly Father. He's the pinnacle of what a father should be. Not all of us have had um, perfect earthly fathers, which are a type of what our Heavenly Father should be like. And some of us have askewed images of God because of our earthly, earthly Heavenly Fathers. But Jesus sets the record straight. Our Father, who art in heaven, is agape. And this is really what the eternal, the everlasting gospel is. The everlasting gospel is the good news about the Father in the face of Jesus. And so when you look at that statement, that the good news about God is really better than what we think it ever was. John 14, 9 says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That's a radical revelation of who God is, what he's like, and how he operates. Isaiah 53, 9. Shh, 
Isaiah, Isaiah 53.9 And he made his grave with the wicked, talking about the Messiah. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. So when Jesus says, if you see me, you see the Father. And then a prophecy is made about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And it says, no violence was in his mouth, neither any deceit. I absolutely now believe that the Father has no violence in him because the image of God, the only begotten Son, had no violence in him. The life of Christ rests as the ultimate revelation of the Father. And because Christ did no violence... I, we believe that the Father does absolutely no violence. And once we believe this, we believe that sin is redefined from the perspective of God. That's a radical statement. Because humanity views sin from a certain way. But God views sin from a completely different perspective. 1 John chapter 3 verse 4. 1 John chapter 3 verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses, violates, violates also the law. For sin is transgression of the law. There's no doubt that sin is breaking God's law. But is the law a set of rules? Or is the law a parameter of what love looks like? Matthew chapter 22 36 Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. 36 Master which is the great commandment in the law Jesus said unto him thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul and with all thy mind this is the first and great commandment and the second is like unto it thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets so Love is the commandment. God's agape love is the commandment. The problem with breaking Ten Commandments is it's not that you're breaking a set of rules, but the problem with breaking the Ten Commandments is that we're not following the principles that make life possible. God bless you. Thank you. So breaking the Ten Commandments... It's not about a, a checklist of do's and don'ts. It's, a, it's about we're not following the principles of God's agape love, which makes life possible. God's agape love is righteousness. God's agape love is the principle that makes life possible. God's agape love is the Ten Commandments. And when I have a spirit-filled life, my life will reflect the Ten Commandments. When I don't have a spirit-filled life, my life won't reflect the Ten Commandments because love is a fulfillment of the law. Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love, agape, is the fulfilling of the law. So, really, when we break the law like first john chapter 3 verse 4 says what we're doing is we're breaking agape we're not living by agape and the bible dares to even expand on the definition of sin so from our perspective sin is not living by god's agape love it's not loving god it's not loving our neighbor that's what sin is but god expands this definition of sin even more. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So that evil heart of unbelief is the equivalent of sin because sin separates us from God. So an evil heart causes us to depart because it's sin. Romans 14, 23. 
Romans 14, 23 says this, And he that doubts is damned if he eat, because he eats not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So sin, according to God's perspective, at its core essence, isn't about breaking rules, but sin is a mindset that doesn't trust God, that doesn't believe God, that doesn't have faith in God. Sin is a mindset that doesn't love God or others. So once we see the nonviolent character of God and we allow scripture to explain scripture, we see that sin is really a mindset. And because our mind is thoughts, words, actions, habits, character. We see that really the sin that needs to be taken care of is the mindset of unbelief and no faith, of hatred. That needs to be changed before our actions can be changed because you can't change the actions without changing the mind. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 and 2. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Shall we continue in sin? God forbid. If we look at this as a checklist, then it'll say, Shall we continue to break the rules? God forbid. That will lead us down one road of always trying to correct behavior instead of a mindset. But Paul is not talking about God forbid that you don't keep a checklist of rules of do's and don'ts. Paul is saying God forbid that we live a life where we're constantly living by the principles that make life impossible. God is saying, God forbid we continue in a life of hatred and unbelief. When Paul says, God forbid, he's not saying that you cannot do these things. What he's saying is, why do you want to do these things? Shall we continue in a mindset of hatred and unbelief that makes life possible? Paul says, God forbid that we should live a life where our mindset is hatred and unbelief. Why would we want to do that? Those thoughts should never enter our mind. That's why he said, God forbid. Not because you can't, but because those ideas of living by the principles that make life impossible should never enter our mind. A radical shift because sin changes from actions to a mindset, salvation changes from actions to mindset. Jeremiah 17, 14. Jeremiah 17, 14 says this, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. This is Hebrew parallelism, where the first portion of the passage explains the second, right? Heal me and I shall be healed. That's the equivalent of save me and I will be saved. Jesus confirms this. Luke chapter 5, verse 29. Luke 5, 29. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of tax collectors and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So these are the words of Jesus. Jesus says that the righteous are healthy and that sinners are the sick ones. This is 
radically different on how we view salvation where salvation becomes an entirely different issue altogether in the nonviolent view of God where sin is an issue of the mind it's not an issue of rules Jesus ultimately did not die to pay the penalty of rule breaking so that God could have a reason to forgive and love me because of broken rules Jesus ultimately died to show us what divinity looks like under the most extreme conditions of pain torture and death we say this all the time but what Jesus reveals on the cross is that God is trustable you can have faith in him and you can believe that he loves you because if divinity is willing to go through all of this and not strike back this is the kind of God that you can trust so the death of Jesus on the cross was salvation because it heals our minds from the lives of Satan which took place at the knowledge of good and evil which said did God say can you trust God? Can you believe God? Can you have faith in God? He's hiding things from you. If you eat of this fruit, you'll be like God. So the death of Jesus on the cross proves that we can trust God, we can have faith in God, that we can believe in God, and that we can love God. Because what we see at the cross, we see divinity taking upon itself a massive amount of pain torture and death because it would rather be tortured and killed than to see us tortured and killed salvation isn't an issue of forgiveness it's an issue of healing our minds from the lies of Satan so that we can believe God trust God love God and our brother first John 419 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. If any man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this is the commandment we have from him, that he who loves God loves his brother also. Whew, radical shift and how we view God, sin, salvation, humanity. Oftentimes, because of Christian indoctrination, we see two groups of people. We see Jew and Gentile. We see, we see Christian and unbeliever. We see pagan and child of God. But that's not how God views us. God perspective of humanity is completely different than man's perspective of humanity and the nonviolent revelation of God gives us a new view of humanity John 17 23 John 17 23 says this that's Luke John 17 23 I am them and thou and me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them even as thou hast loved me that's pretty clear that Jesus himself says that the father loves the entire world the same way that he loves Jesus there's not much to add to that that's a hard pill to swallow because of the indoctrination that we've received from denominational churches. 2 Corinthians 5.19 To wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their sins unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's another harsh but plain passage God does not hold the sins of the world against them that's hard but it's true Romans 3 19 now we know that what things soever the law saith it saith to them that are under the law 
that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. No doubt that's true. Therefore the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. All true. But now the righteousness of God without the law is made known by being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, there is no difference. So the righteousness of God is given to two groups. The first group is that right, the righteousness of God is given to all, but it only comes upon those that believe because you can't receive something unless you believe it's been given to you. So God loves the whole world. He's forgiven the whole world and he's given the whole world perfect righteousness. This is a radical revelation in the non violent understanding of God. Titus 1.15 Christianity will reject this the same way it rejected Jesus' words about the love of our Heavenly Father, but it is a true statement. Titus chapter 1 verse 15 Unto the pure all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. So to the pure, all things are pure. That's a radical understanding of the mind of God. When you think about Acts chapter 10, when God sent the vision to Peter of the bugs and said, eat, and Peter said, I've never eaten an unclean thing. And God said, consume. And then later on, Peter explains that God hath told me not to call any man unclean or impure. It's because the mind of God is being revealed to us through the scripture. Because God is pure. Because God knows all things. Because God is agape. He considers everybody forgiven, lovable, and righteous. So to God, there is no favored group of one denominational religion and people do not like when I say that but that's the case because God is no respecter of persons right no denominational group gets God's special love forgiveness and righteousness all humanity is pure to God because all humanity is God's sick children there is no group of humanity that hath attained a special level of righteousness all righteousness is God's personal righteousness that he gives to us, right? If we just think critically for a second, how many parents that have sick children dying of cancer would tell their sick ch child dying with cancer that I cannot love you, that I cannot forgive you for being sick, that I cannot consider you perfect or pure because you're not healthy like your other brothers and sisters. If our loving Heavenly Father is a much better example of being a parent than we sinners, no earthly parent would do such a thing. I can't love you because you're sick. I can't forgive you because you're sick. I can't consider you perfect because you're not healthy like your brothers and sisters. God is way better of a parent than us sinful parents. And the reason why we view God as being both good and evil is because we have wrong ideas about God from the knowledge of good and evil. We have wrong ideas about what sin really is. We have wrong ideas about what salvation really is. We have wrong ideas about how God views humanity. It's a fact that we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's absolutely true. We all do evil things. But our perspective is that the good should be blessed and the evil should be destroyed. But if God were to destroy the evil every human in existence would be destroyed because we're all evil. We lack the infinite understanding that takes to forgive all, to love all, and to consider all pure. 
None of us can understand what happens in each other's lives. The hurt, the pain, the damage that was done to us. Only God knows that. We're limited to our perception. But if we stop and ask ourselves, what is the evil that I have done that has caused hurt, damage, and pain to others? Then I'll be able to reach out and love others who are evil like I am, who are hurtful like I am, that I can forgive others who are evil like me, and that I can view people with the same grace and understanding that I want for myself. It's because we lack the infinite knowledge of God, and we're only capable of seeing the evil in others and not ourselves, is why we're so ignorant, why we believe God is like us, why we only love those who we perceive as good and we hate those who we perceive as evil. But God, with infinite understanding, loves everyone, forgives everyone, and blesses everyone with perfect righteousness. God's perspective is not our perspective. Those are two different things. And we need to let God redefine who he is what sin is, what salvation is, and who humanity is. And we even need God to help us redefine what the scriptures are actually about. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That is very important. All scripture is given by inspiration of God with the ultimate conclusion of correction, beliefs, and instruction in righteousness. Second Peter 1.19. Second Peter 1.19 We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Very important. We cannot privately interpret the scriptures. James chapter 1 verse 22. James chapter 1 verse 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself and goes away and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whosoever looks into the perfect law of freedom and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. This is very important, that the scriptures are like a mirror. The Old Testament is like a mirror that is to reflect back to us what man is actually like. These three passages don't say that the Old Testament is an inspired revelation about God from God. It does not say that. These passages say that scripture cannot be privately interpreted because it's inspired by God to be a mirror, to reflect back to man what he really is, to teach us, to correct us, to reprove us, and to instruct us in righteousness. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. Matthew eleven twenty-seven. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father. No man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knows any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. This is very important. That Jesus is the ultimate and final revelation of God to divinity. 
the Old Testament as vastly important revelations about history, poetry, God's will, God's word, God's commandments, which is a revelation of love. But what the Old Testament is not, it's not the ultimate revelation of the Father. Jesus Christ is the ultimate revelation of the Father. We have to grasp this because the written word of the Old Testament is subject to the living word of Jesus Christ. When we use the Bible in a chronological order to get our belief system about God, we are making a drastic error because Jesus is the ultimate revelation of the Father. And the Old Testament has a satanic veil over it. And if we're not careful, we will end up getting a satanic understanding about God. We need Jesus. Luke 24 to 27. Luke 24 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Verse 44. Luke 27, Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. This is vastly important because if Jesus doesn't open our mind so that we can understand scripture, the only thing left is the satanic veil that will blind us to the character of God. 2 Corinthians 3.13 And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away. Even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon the mind. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, when the Old Testament is turned to the Lord, the veil is upon the heart. The Bible is pretty clear. There's a satanic veil that blinds us to the character of God. Only Jesus can take this covering away. And what we notice in the Old Testament is that Satan plays a very subtle and a very deceptive role in the Old Testament. And I want to thank my wife for this portion because she's the one that introduced me to this idea, so I'm very thankful. And let's see this very subtle and very deceptive role. 2 Samuel 24, 1. Second Samuel 24, 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he, the Lord, moved David against them to say, Go and number Israel and Judah. So Second Samuel 24, verse 1 says that God moves David to do something bad, so he has a pretext to hurt Israel. Come on, that's iniquity. That's thinking evil. In agape, there is no iniquity. There is no thinking evil. But that's what the Old Testament says, that God moved David to do something stupid so he could have a pretext to punish Israel. First Chronicles 21, 1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. That's pretty clear. In one passage it says that God tells David to do something bad and then in another passage, same story, it says that Satan was the one that provoked David. So Satan's role in the Old Testament is very subtle. It's very deceptive. When what Satan does in the Old Testament is that he often takes the place of God in the Old Testament, deceiving people into thinking he is God. Here's the evidence. Again, this evidence came from my wife. Exodus 
2320. Exodus 2320. This is God speaking. And behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee in the place which I have prepared for you. So God is allowing an angel to go before the children of Israel to keep them in the way and to bring them into the place which I have, which God prepared for them. Let's see who this angel is. Beware of him, obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. This is very important. This is after Exodus 19 when the children of Israel reject the voice of God. This is so important. Exodus 23, 20 and 21. We see God warning his children, saying that there is an angel that goes before you. Beware of him. Do not provoke him. He will not hold your, he will not forgive your sins. And my name is in him. That's very that's very important passage. Matthew 24, 5. Matthew 24, 5 says this. This is Jesus speaking. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying that I am Christ, and deceive many. This is the same thing that happened in the Old Testament. Because the children of Israel rejected God as their leader, they stepped out of his hedge of protection. And once you reject God, there is only one other God, small g God of this world, and that's Satan. And God says, there is this angel who is about to lead over you. Beware of him. Don't provoke him because he will not forgive your sins. My name is in him. This is the reality of the Old Testament. This is the satanic veil that Satan disguises himself as the Lord to people who have rejected the one true God. So in the Old Testament, when you see a supernatural being interacting with God's people being called Lord, that does not mean it's the one true God. If this Lord is sinning and destroying and leading people to do similar things of iniquity, it's Satan disguising himself in the veil, using the Lord's name. That's what Exodus 23, 20, and 21 show us. When my wife showed me that, I was blown away. These are deeper realities that we need to face, right? These deeper realities of the veil or the disguise of Satan moving in the name of God, deceiving humanity in the Old Testament so that God's character seems like a murderer, a liar, a flutter, a destroyer of men. We need to face these deep truths, these deep realities. We don't want to face them, but there's a necessity to face them. The Bible that we have is not necessarily the Bible that we want, right? We want a Bible that gives us a checklist of do's and don'ts so that we can be approved of God, so that we can get a thumbs up of God because of the self-righteous checklist of how we've only done the do's. But at the same time, we want to have a book of religious beliefs that justify the evil that we want to do to others. That's what the heart of humanity wants. A checklist of do's and don'ts, while at the same time, a simultaneous thumbs up to do evil to others. But the Bible that we have is not the Bible that we want. The Bible that we have is the Bible that we need. That's a very important point, that the Bible is an accurate account of the wicked heart of humanity from the very beginning and how the people of God have always done wicked, evil, murder, lies, stealing, killing, burning, and pillaging in the name of God so that they didn't have to account for their own sins. That's very important. 
that the Bible, specifically the Old Testament, shows us our own face, which is the mirror principle. It shows us the face of projecting sin onto God. But the Bible that we have is absolutely honest. It tells us absolutely the truth about how wicked humanity is, even to the point where it says that we killed our own creator. So the Bible is honest, which we do not want. Because if the Bible is honest, we have to face a reality that we don't want to face. That there isn't a checklist of do's and don'ts which makes me superiorly righteous than others. There isn't a book that justifies the evil that I want to do. But there is a book that reveals how wicked we have become. There is a book that says God loves everybody. There is a book that says God forgives everybody. There is a book that says God considers everybody righteous. And there is a book that says be very careful when you read this because there is a God of vengeance and destruction, but that God is actually the angel, the destroyer, the Satan. Be very careful if you follow him because he will destroy you. As we look at the nonviolent revelation of God, not just in the life of Jesus, but ultimately throughout the entire scriptures, Jesus' life of nonviolence is the ultimate revelation. But this idea of a nonviolent God, this sets the tone and it sets the record on sh it sets the record straight on everything that mankind needs to know. The truth about God, the truth about sin, the truth about salvation, the truth about humanity, and the truth about scriptures. This is why we believe and say different things about the Bible, because we now have a different perspective of God, of sin, salvation, humanity, and the scriptures. Maybe when you study with us, you may see the same things, but these aren't to redefine doctrine. They're not to knock down denominational churches. This is what we see as we view the nonviolent life of Christ. We pray that as you study with us, you see God in a nonviolent, loving, forgiving, restorative revelation as well. Let's pray. We praise you, Heavenly Father, because we're so blessed by your love for us, your forgiveness to us, and your restoration of righteousness to us. Oh, we don't really have much to say because our mind is in awe. So we thank you for the blessings of truth. We thank you for the beauty and excellency of your agape love. And we just ask, Lord, that the peace that we have would be as a river through the rest of the day. And may our minds ponder and cherish all that you are to the capacity that we know now. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody, I don't know who's here, but I love y'all. God bless y'all. Good to see you, Harvey. Good to see you, Ma. Good to see you, Keely and Cindy and Kathy. Love y'all.